forget to record. And welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Paul. Now, Andy is an author. His most recent book is Sell Without Selling Out. He's also a podcast host, hmm? and not just any podcast host. We've just been talking off air, and Andy's had over a thousand episodes of Sales Enablement with Andy Paul. So yours truly needs to be on best behavior today. <laughs> but Andy, Andy, welcome. Fred, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, great to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll give me hints and tips at the end of where I can improve my own performance. <laughs> I guess the first is to shut, oh, far, up so and, good. shut up and start asking questions, Fred. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I want to get straight in, straight into this selling okay. out and selling in issue. Sure. Yeah. So essentially, selling out and selling in, what's the difference? <laughs> well, so I set up the frame in the book that, that um, yeah, you're either selling out or you're selling in. So selling out is sort of this conventional sales behaviors that make buyers cringe, that so we're all familiar with what they are. Uh, you know, pitching, listening to talk, uh, talking too much. I mean, I could spend a lot of time just talking about the things that, that we all know. And yeah, I categorize those behaviors as salesy behaviors or selling out. The fact is that they don't work very well, yet we continue to persist in using them. Uh, you know, if you look at a buyer's decision as being primarily driven by their, according to research from Challenger and other people, primarily driven by their experience working with the seller, their buying experience. A challenger, I think they said, you know, 53% of, of the decision the buyers use to, uh, criteria the buyers use to make their decision is based on their experience with the individual seller. So why then would you continue to <laughs> persist in trying to use behaviors that the buyers don't like that creates a negative buying experience? And as I was writing this book, it was just sort of occurred to me it's, <laughs> that there's no reason we can't just stop. And we don't have to do this anymore. We can just stop. <laughs> I mean, it's far too right? easy. Andy. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it, it doesn't, they don't work. The buyers don't like them. Uh, they're not helping you achieve the results you want to achieve. So let's stop. So the alternative that I put forward is to say, look, there's four behaviors that I call selling in that are really geared towards creating this positive buying experience. But more important, or not I mean, as importantly, is that these behaviors are natural human, innate human behaviors, right? It's, it's the thing with selling in and the salesy behaviors we all know, those are learned behaviors. So what I describe in the book is, is four pillars of selling in, connection, curiosity, understanding, and generosity. You know, we are wired as human beings to connect with other human beings. We are wired to be curious. We use, you know, in our normal day-to-day -day lives, we use curiosity as a way to navigate the world around us, you know, make sense of complex situations, which we encounter all the time. Uh, understanding is certainly tied to curiosity, but also it's tied to our ability to be, uh, have empathy for other people and to understand what they're going through and how we can help them. And we're wired to be generous. I mean, this is, uh, generosity is, uh, makes us feel good. It's why we do it um, instinctively. And not to mention, that's also a, a trigger for reciprocity. So we have a choice. You know, we can continue down this path that's just not working very well and it's working less well than it has before with selling out. You know, we see, all see the figures and the stats about declining win rates, uh, low quota attainment across the board in B2B sales. And yet so many sales are seem to be doubling down, right? When things get tough, they said, well, let's do more of the, the crap that doesn't work instead of saying, yeah, let's, let's, let's change. Let's make this a positive experience for the buyer. How do we do that? How do we help them achieve the things that are most important to them? And if we had that focus, things would be different. Brilliant. When you put it like that, I mean, I, we, I'm kind of giggling here, but it's it's not funny actually. It's like we are doing things which don't work <clears throat> instead of you know, stopping them and doing things which we are naturally built to do. It's just mm -hmm. it's crazy when you put it like that. 
Well, and that's the thing. That's what never has made sense to me. And throughout my entire career, I, as I describe in the book, is is pretty early on in my career, I decided <laughs> I I can't sell that way, right? That's just not me. That's not aligned with who I am. It's not aligned with my strengths. And that should be the goal of everyone. When I talk about the subtitle of this book is a guide to success on your own terms is this is book is in part an effort to help people understand how to become the best version of themselves in sales and to lean into that and to in some cases resist the pressures that inevitably come to conform to a way of selling that isn't you and isn't what your buyers want from you it's uh, you, you do talk about the first training course you ever went on and, and again, oh, yeah. I was kind of, I was giggling as I was reading that. T -t -t tell us the story. Tell us the story of what was going on. I was giggling, but again, it, it's serious stuff because this is still happening. But oh, yeah. tell, tell, tell us what went on. Well, I mean, I, I started my career working for a company called Burroughs. It is now Unisys. Um, I'm not even sure if Unisys, I think Unisys still exists. But at the time, it's the second largest computer company in the world. And at that time, Big tech companies like Burroughs and IBM and Xerox swept up hundreds and hundreds of new college graduates and enrolled them in these sales training programs. I mean, it really is like a two-year program that basically see who was going to cut it, right? They'd hire five people for every position. They, they would assume they're going to weed everybody else out. So after I'd been on board for two weeks, I was sent to this training class um, at one of our national training centers and had new sellers from all over the country show up there. And we were watching videos of this guy named Lee Boy, And <laughs> Lee Boy was came across as like this, at least for American audience to understand sort of the type, the slick back hair, fast talking, sort of like a Sunday evangelical preacher on TV. And you know, but what they're preaching was just like, to me, it was like, God, what human being acts this way? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, so out of the realm of what I thought the way humans acted toward each other. And it became clear to me very quickly that either I was going to have a very short career in sales, or I was going to find a way to, to make sales work for me in a way that aligned with who I was and what I thought my own strengths, my own values, and my own characters were. And it's, it, uh, it's sort of been one journey along that path ever since. See, at this stage, I would love to say, well, that was then and this is now. But as you've said, now people are still persisting with this as being a clever mm -hmm. way to sell. And again, I don't want to get too much into this on this podcast. I'll look at like the better way. Right. But just quickly, well, why do you think it is still promoted as a clever and, and a good thing to do? When, you know, as you said, customers don't like it. It doesn't really work. Yeah. And it's just unnatural. So, so what, what's happening? Why, why are we still doing it? <laughs> Well, because I think we have just the wrong frame of mind or the wrong framework or perspective about what selling is. And so if you think your job as a salesperson is to go out and persuade somebody to buy your product, which invariably most sellers think that is the case, then it's going to encourage you to act in a specific way or you know, adopt certain behaviors. See, I believe that's, that's completely wrong. I think the job of a seller is to listen, to understand what's most important to the buyer and then help the buyer get that. And so it's, it's a very different approach to the world. One is you may have a problem. The only solution is my product, right? Because I'm going to persuade you that this, as opposed to saying, well, hmm, let me listen. What? So what is the most important thing to you? What is the most important thing? Do you want a problem you need to solve? Most important outcome you want to achieve? How can I help you get that? Completely different set of actions that you'll take if you believe that's what your job is. And so I think part of our task as sales leaders say, look, we need to change the orientation of what sales is and what you, your understanding as a seller, what your job is. It's not to flog your product, it's to help the buyer achieve the thing that's most important to them. Yeah, no, it, it is. And it, I often just talk about the difference between active listening and, and search listening. You know, and active listening is what you're what you talk about. It's like you're so totally trying to understand everything that somebody is saying. Whereas search listening is he's going to say it, he's going to say, it. oh, yes, Andy said that. Bing. That means I can say this now. Hey, guess what? I've got this really good way. That... Exactly. Uh, 
Yeah, but you just missed a whole load of really important stuff that I was talking about. It's just got maybe Hexy were bothered about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I also think that part of part of what I believe is is that, and this has certainly been my experience over decades, <laughs> selling everything from your know, women's shoes to nine-figure complex communication systems, is that there is always one thing that's most important to the buyer, right? When they're looking to buy a new solution for something, yeah, they've got a lot of requirements. But there's always one thing that's more important than all the others. And if you take that frame of mind that I'm trying to discover what that is and how I can help the buyer get that, that's going to put you in a position to, to win more often than not because that's the thing that's most important to the buyer. Help them get the thing that's most important to them. Yeah, and, and I think... I'm wondering if for a lot of people that's difficult because at the surface level, it's, oh, it's ROI. It's this functionality. It's this thing that's sort of quantifiable, tangible, easy to talk about. But in reality, but it's, it's, it's a lot deeper and you've got exactly. to go personal and it's those human motivators. And they're hard to talk about, Clafton. Right? Well, they can be. So well, in the yeah, book, I give, <laughs> I, give, I give some examples of how to get there. Um, but it's, you know, just one, you know, easy example perhaps is, is that, you know, a lot of times where sellers fails, they don't ask the right follow-up questions and follow-up questions are like the easiest questions to ask because they don't even have to be, they can be very sort of non-specific. I mean, love the question. This read this one the first time in Michael Bungay Stanier's book, the coaching habit, which is oh interesting. And what else can you tell me about that? I mean, the thing that sellers trip up is they they stop asking questions because they think they need they need to be more knowledgeable before they can ask certain questions, and you don't need to be. You just need to be sincere in your interest in the buyer, and they'll answer the questions if you've built the trustworth you know level of trustworthiness with them. They'll answer the question. So asking great follow up questions. Yeah, I listen to recordings of sellers, and it's like. They'll ask a question, the buyer will give the answer and they go, mm-hmm. You can just tell they're, <laughs> you know, they're taking a note and then moving to the next question on their list of questions they typically ask, as opposed to saying, oh, they've left the door open for me to go deeper, right? Let's ask a follow-up question. Maybe I'll ask that same question. And what else can you tell me? Maybe I'll ask it twice in a row, maybe three times in a row. You know, I'll go until the customer is sort of exhausted it. And then, yeah, I'll recap. You know, reflect back to them. Okay, this this is what I heard you say. Did I get that right? But what follows then is the question that sellers always miss, which is one of the most powerful questions you can ask, is once you've fed back to the buyer what you thought you heard and they've confirmed that's what you heard, that you're right, then you ask, okay, so what are we missing? Just when we think we've uncovered everything and the buyer agrees, then we say, okay, what are we missing? Mm. And then you start that cycle. It goes even deeper, right? Yeah. Sellers. Such an elegant question. I love that. I love yeah. that. But it, it comes with that mindset, though, of genuinely wanting to find out what we're missing, to go mm -hmm. deep, rather than going, got any budget? Yeah. Who yep. makes a decision? Yeah. Do you yep. have a need? Yeah. When are you going to do that? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. You pass. You qualify. Right. Let me show you my demo. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's <laughs> what passes, what passes for qualification is not qualification. I mean, for me is there is no one time qualification. I mean, you're sort of qualifying along the way as well as the, the buyers qualifying you. Yeah. But at the end of the day is, is this important for sellers to think about is you don't have a qualified prospect, I believe, until they've done their internal business case about it until they've quantified the value they're going to receive from your solution they're not really fully qualified they're if they don't take that step and this is oftentimes what leads to like a customer saying oh we're just not ready right now thank you for your time you know we'll, we're going to revisit this in six months or whatever it means you hadn't gotten to them to the point where they're going to say yeah let's take a look, take a look and see okay if, if our most important thing is increasing revenue by 5%. What does that mean in terms of dollar stuff, right? What is the ramifications of that? Or if we want to increase our market share 10%, what does that mean in terms of, you know, whatever currency you use, I was using dollars, in terms of dollars. Until we sort of put that out, 
no one's ready to make a decision. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I'm just thinking about, so you can see me making notes here, about people wanting to show that they're knowledgeable. Mm. And it's like the battle to be knowledgeable and effective is like kind of the knowledgeable piece wins, doesn't it? Because it's like, oh, I've got to tell them the stuff that I know. And I see it quite a lot in younger salespeople or kind of less experienced, maybe I should say, mm. because they feel, oh, I've got to show that I know something here. So they're desperate to say stuff. But I do see that people are quite experienced as well. It's like, oh, I've got to tell the customer things. To, to, to kind of earn, earn my place, if you like, rather than by asking the questions, asking the questions, letting them talk. And that, that I don't know, again, for me and you, it's, well, there's, I mean, there's don't the old, do that, but it's, it's a hard one to break, I think. Hard sure, I mean, there's the old, the old maxim attributed to Voltaire, and I, <laughs> but he didn't say it, but it's attributed to him, which is, you know, judge a man by his questions, right? I mean, that's, that's what buyers do. Yeah, I'm talking back to my own experience. I got my first job, professional sales, <clears throat> selling uh, at the time were computers that took up most of a room, uh, selling to construction industry for accounting, uh, you know, full general ledger accounting, job cost accounting, and so on. And, you know, fresh out of school, I looked, I was 21. I looked like I was 16. <laughs> I was selling to these very successful business owners, entrepreneurs, CEOs of these companies. And I started asking myself, why, why are they investing their time in me? Because I know nothing. And it's because I was sincerely interested in them. Mm. And if you have that sincere interest, and they could tell I was sincere about learning, they didn't expect me to know everything. They appreciated the questions. And the and then a level of effort and the interest. And that's how I learned. It became like, like this you know, business school I was attending on my first two years of my job, talking to all these smart people about how they built their businesses and the concerns they had and so on. And my level of knowledge about business was you know, very, very shallow. Yeah. But I was learning. But I think that's the key for new sellers is you don't have to feel like you have to know everything. You just have to be curious. You have to be willing to keep asking questions till you understand what they're telling you. If you don't understand, don't walk away. Ask another question. And, and the other way I'll position this for people is that your job by asking questions is to help them think. Because yes. while they're telling you stuff, they're thinking. And, and what's better to, for somebody to, you, you walk out of the meeting and they go, oh, that's good. That guy really learned his catalog very well. Or, wow, that guy really made me think. But I've got to go off and look up something that he asked me because I gave a question. I'm not even sure I'm right. Oh, yeah. Well, that's Where that's do you want to right? be? Surely the latter. Yeah, well, I even talk about that in the book. I, I talk about a specific type of question you can ask called an insight question. And so often sellers think about providing insights by, just as you said, by telling people things. Well, here's an insight we learned from another buyer. Sure, that's good. That, people appreciate that. But it's much more powerfully delivered in the form of a question. Yeah. And so if you have a, something you've learned from an existing customer that is something you think another buyer should, should really learn, Phrase it to them as a question. Ask them something about their business that you could reasonably expect them to know, but they don't. Whoa, that's powerful. Just as you said, because they're like, oh, those are smart people. They asked me a really interesting question I hadn't thought about before. Uh, it's um, that's, that's our quest to try and help people with, with, with this stuff, isn't it? But, but if you are genuinely curious, or as I say, the reason I like being in sales is because I'm just a nosy git. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I just like Find out about people. <laughs> I talk about that in the book. I said, yeah, one of the things you're trying to do is you're trying to earn the right to stick your nose into somebody else's business. <laughs> and you get paid for doing this. I mean, you get paid for doing, yeah. brilliant job, eh? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, so uh, curiosity. We could talk about curiosity all day. Um, connection then, because this mm. is another interesting one when we look at what people have almost like falsely learned to do in sales. <laughs> to try and make friends with everybody <laughs> to what genuine <laughs> i knew i'd get you on this one <laughs> uh, to kind of the genuine connection piece so again you know love you love your thoughts around this well first of all there's there's whole strata of people that that in sales who believe that you know this idea of having a connection or a relationship with a buyer means a friendship and the fact is that it doesn't i never was trying to be friends with my buyers i we were friendly enough and and so on but yeah, for social purposes, I don't think I've ever stayed in touch with one of them. I mean, it's... Did he go to their weddings? 
No, no bad things. Didn't know them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was interested in them while we were engaged, and and yeah, you sort of stay casually in touch. But that's not the goal. The goal is to, to have that connection that opens the door to building credibility and trust with someone. And to do that, you just have to be human. You know, you have to be interested in that person, sincerely interested in that person. You have to, you know, do the small things that that some people want to denigrate these days, like small talk. I mean, you so you got to form a common bond, you know, find common ground with somebody. Um, just, said, just be human, be a good human. I, I, I find it laughable. You know, there's some people out there say, oh, you don't need to be likable in sales. And sure, I'm sure it's what I call possible, but not probable that you can win business without being trustworthy or without being likable. But why wouldn't you be? It costs you nothing to be likable. Absolutely nothing. You know, there's so few things under your control in sales. Why not exercise the things you can control? So just be a decent human being. Robert Cialdini in his book, Persuasion, found that, you know, buyers are most likely to buy from sellers that they think like them. And so, you know, this likability is, is not decisive, but it's, it's important. Right. I mean, it's like a lot of things in sales. What can things you can do to differentiate yourself? As, as I like to say, you know, I'll ask somebody, a seller, I said, so tell me, what was your margin of victory on your last deal you won? How much did you win by? Did you win by 10%, 20%? Well, you can't quantify it, right? <laughs> because it's not a matter of price. It's like, how much did you win by? Well, I don't know. So you just have to be 1% better than the next person. The buyer's making the decision based on their buying experience with you. You just have to be 1% better. So why not deploy those things that, that you can do that, that are under your direct control? For instance, be responsive to the buyer. You know, prioritize getting back to the buyer with the answers to the questions they need. Uh, you know, prioritize being responsive and providing them content or some val something of value that'll help them make progress in their buying process. Responsiveness has been a huge thing for me in my career. Because I said early on, it's like, oh, well, this is one of the things I can control. Right? Yeah. So I'm going to take advantage of that. And so that's sort of become my hallmark is yeah, being responsive makes a difference yeah well it's part of it, all these go into building trust don't they so responsiveness providing something of value mm. again another interesting thing so i think we're now just starting to touch into the generosity mm. so I, yes. you know generosity is by giving stuff away <laughs> you know, yeah well, anyone, anyone could do that you don't have to be a salesperson to give stuff away <laughs> sure well but you as i talk about in the book is the goal is to become a a giver with an agenda. You know, if you want to build trust with somebody, you have to be transparent about what your motivations are. It's one of the keys of building trust. One of the four sort of cornerstones of trust that multiple people have laid out is you have to be transparent with the buyer. So it's okay for the buyer to understand that if they succeed, you'll succeed. I mean, that's fine. You have something at stake as well as they do. But your motivation is to help them succeed because it'll help you do better. Now, giving gets sort of a, a bad name in sales because we're accustomed people to sort of, I don't know if you use the same expression you have in the UK, but it's, you know, show up and throw up, right? Yeah. It's just, you got to show up and just, I'm just going to spew everything I know. Well, that's, a, that's what I call an unrestrained giver or a bad giver because, yeah, there's no context for what you're, you're giving. You don't understand the buyer. You just throwing everything against the wall, hoping something sticks. And the buyer doesn't have time for that. But if you're an effective good giver, you understand what's most important to the buyer. And the value you're providing are things that help the buyer make progress towards achieving their goal. And that's what they want. They have time for that. Because then, you know, I think what sellers need to think about this is that in every sales interaction, the buyer's making an investment of their time and attention in you. And so are you giving them something of value in return that enables them to earn a return on the time and attention they invested in you? 
And if you do, you get more time. If you don't help them with value that, that gives them a return on that time they invested in, you don't get more time. It's pretty simple. It, it is. You're making this all sound extremely simple. And actually, that's the point. It is. But we've got these bad habits baked in that somewhere along the line, people thought were a great idea. Um, and yeah, something else you said there. Again, you're saying lots of things that are just so many in each of these senses make progress towards achieving the goal. Mm. Now, isn't that a lot easier if you also understand what their goal is? Or we oh, yeah. understand it together. I mean, then we can really start to make progress because, as you say, the generosity is directed. We can start to really do things that are moving the dial, not trying to make sort of one size fits all. That's a really well, important I mean, part of selling. Yeah. Well, I th I, so in the book, I, I have a definition of value, which is, again, very, very simple, which is, you know, first off, we all know value is in the, only in the eye of the beholder, right? It's yep. not what yep. we think is valuable. It's only what yep. the buyer thinks is valuable. So the buyer centric definition of value is as a result of me meeting with you or, you know, <laughs> doing a zoom call with you or reading your email or reading your piece of content. If as a result of that investment on my time and attention, I'm now closer to making a decision than I was before that had value. That's value progress. Yeah. If I can't help you, the buyer, make progress toward making your decision it has to be a huge step. <laughs> it could be a small, but if I can't help you be closer to making that decision after I've interacted with you than before, then there was no value in that interaction. So why did we do it? Yeah. So you have to be intentional. The thing about selling is, is it's, it's all about intent being intentional. And so you should be able to go down your pipeline or with, if you're a seller or as a sales leader, go down the pipeline with, with your individual sellers. And for every qualified opportunity, say, what value, ask the question, what value does the buyer need from us on the very next interaction in order to move closer to making a decision? And if a seller doesn't know the answer to that question, then they need to go back and start asking more questions, right? They need to deploy their curiosity that they're not ready to have that next interaction because they don't know what the buyer needs from them. There's no reason to guess. Ask the question. Ah, but it's the angle you're asking the question from. What value does the buyer need from us? It's, it's poles away. It's, it's 180 degrees different to what do we need to do to them to make them go to our oh, next exactly. step? <laughs> that is a huge, huge difference. It is. So this is why I said mindset and perspective is everything. And this is, this is the driving issue. The driving issue is sellers have the wrong perspective about what their job is. Selling is not something you do to somebody. We don't sell something to somebody, even that's the way the grammar works. It's a collaborative effort that we do with someone. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I'm all over that. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's why we're so much on the same page. We use slightly different words in many ways, but we're saying so much of the same stuff. Um, so connection, mm. curiosity, understanding all the way through generosity i mean these all these all work together but it's it starts at as the song goes that starts at the very beginning it's that mindset of what angle you for me the way i, I see it mm -hmm. what angle you're coming at it from um and this is this, more collaborative right and it's it, it's reinforced by how we how we recruit salespeople. the words we use to describe the language right is something I how many times you see a I was just doing this this morning. I was going through <laughs> job postings for salespeople online. And yeah, oftentimes I ask this question of sales leaders. I said, okay, so, you know, you've got these attributes that you want to hire for, you know, aggressive extrovert out, yeah, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I said, so let me ask you a question. What do your buyers need from your salespeople? What do your buyers need from your salespeople? What qualities they need what attributes do they need and it's like vacant stares right no one's asked <laughs> i mean if our job is to make sure the buyer has the right buying experience wouldn't we want to ask them well what do you need from a salesperson because they'll tell you 
I mean, there are books that are out there that have interviews, you know, CROs and, you know, C-level executives that buy. Yeah, they just, they'd be happy if somebody, yes, they'd like somebody who knew something about their business, but they more importantly, they'd like somebody who's curious, who didn't, you know, who's, who, who didn't pretend that they knew things that they didn't know. I mean, yeah. that just start there. And so I like to say is, is, you know, what's the one question a buyer will never ask you? And I'll, like, I'll ask this when I'm speaking in public and people say, oh, they'll never ask you to raise your price. And I said, no, I've had, I've had buyers ask me to raise my price. But the yeah. one question they'll never ask you is they'll never say, hey, you know, Fred, really like your product. We're really interested in buying it. But Fred, you're just not salesy enough. Could you be more salesy? You'll never, ever hear a buyer say that. Because it, it has no value for them. But this is what we this is what we train salespeople to do to be more salesy. It's like doesn't help the buyer at all. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say you didn't push me enough, but actually that's not quite right. Because sometimes I think a salesperson, I'm gonna be careful how I use the word, but does need to push with the right intent, you know, sure. or kind of challenge customers. But that's back to the perspectives and the insight, isn't it? Right. And it's asking a question that's uncomfortable for both of us. That's fine. What are we, that's why I love it. What are we missing here? Mm -hmm. I wonder if we are missing. And that's why I love the angle, that wee bit. It's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. such a nugget in there. <laughs> You're not salesy enough. I'm not going to lie from you, mate. <laughs> love it. <laughs> love it. Um, the, the, there's a, in the book, there's, there's a, well, lots of good stuff, but there's um there's a table in there which sets off the different, uh, the different attributes, the different behaviors. Selling mm. out on one side, selling in on the other side. Do you pitch or do you converse? Do you tell, do you ask questions? That's just such a cool table. I mean, I wish we had a couple of hours and we just go through each of those, but uh, <laughs> well, well, then I'll buy the book. Yeah. And that's not what we're doing this book now. Um, but it, it's, it's just a wonderful summary of like, try to be more on the right hand side of that. And well, you are like way if, more modern, you're way more up to date in the way that right. you need to be working today. The way to, for, yeah, if you're listening to the show, to think about any set of behaviors is that. And again, you can do this with selling out versus selling in as they sit on opposite ends of a spectrum. And we're all a mix of these behaviors. I wish I was 100% perfect myself, right? I'm, we're not, none of us are. So the goal is, yeah, I'm trying to shift the mix more toward the selling in end and less toward the selling out. And, you know, that's always sort of our, our endeavor in life with any set of behaviors. Just, yeah, how do we, how do we change the mix? And yeah book is a, a good tool to help you do that it is no it's, it's, it's a good it's a good it's a good little test to work out where am i on that and can you honestly say yes i do that 100 of the time in fact you've got a test anyway haven't you well we do on our website yes uh yeah people can come take a little fun assessment it's just short it's it's <laughs> just i wouldn't say it's scientific but it's it's fun to just sort of get the answer and see where you stand it, it does your job and it makes you think <laughs> which is what good questions do as we were saying right. about half right. an hour ago you know and there it did i i, I did it and uh yeah i was blessed about it so don't judge me on my results Andy. <laughs> but no i looked at it because i was looking i was looking you know the sales the sales trainer the author the author uh mind on and going yeah I like that I, I like what that's doing in helping people to think yeah you, know? that's what we're trying <laughs> you to can't do. write it's, a book it's... about that and then not do it <laughs> right well exactly and but we're trying to trying to reshape this this perspective from sellers to understand that at the end of the day it's how the buyer perceives you right it's it's not yeah. it's not how you know, there's always this gap between how a buyer perceives their own professional or a seller perceives their own professionalism and and how they think they're doing versus how the buyer's receiving it then you need to be more in tune and attuned to how the buyer is receiving you and that is what makes the difference. Yeah, I tell the story in, a, in the book about early in my career, I'm sure you read this, is, is um, I was selling in the construction industry and I was calling on the CEO of this big construction company in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'd been by several times and I'd always gotten the brush off. So I was just coming by again, assuming I was going to get a brush off from the receptionist, but <laughs> to my surprise and my shock, uh, she said, well, just a second, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> and it's one of those like, oh, shit. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And, and, 
And so the CEO comes out in the lobby, gets me, takes him back to his office. This older gentleman is just impeccably dressed casually, but you know, <laughs> his slacks were, like, were more, you know, cost more than my annual salary at that point. And we go into his office, got this massive desk that's, you know, as I described the size of an aircraft carrier. And yeah, you know, I hand him my card and I start going into my pitch, right? As I'd been trained to do. And he listened to me for you know, 15, 20 seconds and holds up his hand and it's like, stop. And so I stop. And he reaches into his top right-hand desk drawer and pulls out the stack of business cards about two inches high. They're bound by rubber band. He takes the rubber band off and he spreads them out like, you know, deck of cards in a casino. And he goes, so, Mr. Paul, he said, these are all the computer salespeople that have called on me in the last year. And I haven't bought from any of them. So why should I buy from you? And this was such an eye-opening moment for me because he wasn't saying, why should I buy from your company? He was saying, why should I buy from you? Well, I had no freaking idea what, <laughs> what the answer to that question was at that time. <laughs> I was, yeah. But yeah, he, the, he sort of mentored me over the next year. I kept calling on him and he's, yeah, he sort of showed me how to sell to him. And for me, that was transformative because I, I understood at that point that it was about me. It was always, I was always going to be the differentiation between my competitors. And I was the reason the buyer was going to buy for me. And I've had this, as I said, I've sold nine figure deals. And the response is always, we bought because of you. And you, and it's also included sometimes team. I wasn't selling all by myself, but I mean, it was, it was me as an individual, as the leading figure. And that's a question, Jerry, customers, you need to answer for your customers. Your customers, excuse me, is why you? Why should they believe you? Why should they trust you? Why should they invest their time in you? Yeah, you know, go down the list of questions. And they all serve sort of the same question. Why you? It's, and this book becomes the answer to that question. You know, it's funny. I, I use that question in training. Um, and, and people say, oh, well, nobody asked you that. I said, no, that's what I'm asking you in training. Yeah, because well, you've, got to artic you've got to articulate. No, they don't say it like I am on training, being right, you've all got two minutes to prepare this and answer me. <laughs> but they are thinking that in some oh, way, shape, or form. Yes, and absolutely. I love doing it early on without any training to see which route people take. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're the biggest supplier of XYZ in the world. We have 400 depots right. all over there. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. I'm blah, honest, blah. untrustworthy. Okay, don't <laughs> you have to tell me that. No, but it's just really cool how people answer, and then we can tweak in. And, and get well, people articulate, articulate it well. But as I talk about in the book, because you, you really can't answer that question. People experience the answer to that question by how you interact with them and how you conduct yourself yeah. with them and the questions you ask. And that's the thing is this, there really wasn't an answer to the question he asked me. But what I learned is it's, yeah, you answer it through your actions. Yeah. Straight and simple. And so why, if that's the case... <laughs> If you default to these pushy persuasion-based techniques that have been taught for decades, that's going to be problematic. If for no other reason than, as I mentioned in the book, I mean, there's a, a book that was published in 2020 by author Jonah Berger. He's a professor at a prestigious business school in the United States, but it's about persuasion. And he said in the book, there's research shows that as humans, we instinct instinctively resist being persuaded. We all do. No one likes to be persuaded. So it makes sense then that we spend billions of dollars a year training salespeople to try to become better persuaders because everybody hates it. So that, you know, logic really, really flows there. Uh, we, we are so much on the same page. So, so much on the same page. It's, um, I don't know, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. We, we could go on long into yes, the night <laughs> uh, no, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do, to do this to do this a little more at some stage but um i'd love to what what parting words what what are we missing that i should have asked oh if you like <laughs> it's all about how you view what your job is yeah. if you view your job is to persuade someone to buy your product and that's sort of like you're approaching life as a zero-sum game right? It's, it's, if the buyer 
doesn't agree that you're the solution, then they must be wrong, which is a great way to approach a relationship with a buyer. Alternatively, I think your job is to be curious to learn what's the most important thing to your buyer and how you can help them get that. Whole different way of looking at the world. Every day you wake up, you approach your job differently, thinking, how can I help my buyer get what's most important to them? As opposed to how can I persuade them to buy my product? Different outcomes at the end of the day. Yeah. And one of those is way more fun as well. And one of them is way more fun. Way yeah, more and for fun. People, and for people that struggle <laughs> with, with, you know, you know, feeling burnt out about their jobs and so on, because they're, you know, day after day, this sort of unrelenting drumbeat of, you know, act this way, do this. And it's like, yeah, you don't have to. That's not the path to success. That's the path to burnout. Brilliant. It's all about how you view what your job is. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. How can people get in touch with you? Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, Andy, yeah, uh, usual preamble, real Andy Paul, if you want to search and uh, type that in. But otherwise, just search for Andy Paul. I'm, I'm sure I'm the first one that comes back. And um, yeah, come visit my website, andypaul.com. We've got, uh, for people that pre-order the book and certainly available through Amazon UK, uh, you can come back to you know, pre-order and then come back and, and uh, you can qualify for some bonuses. We're going to have some events and other things for people to pre-order the book, exclusive events. So yeah. I will encourage people to go and find you on LinkedIn. And to do that as well, because if your bonuses are half as generous as your content on LinkedIn, oh, that's going to be a good set of stuff. <laughs> it's going to be some really good stuff coming out of there, Andy. Yeah, I'm sort of sort of present on LinkedIn a lot. I mean, so. Sort of present is one way to find it. Now it's it's this some brilliant stuff. Always making me think anyway. So oh, thank you. Um, no, nah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. We'll drop those links into the um, into the show notes anyway, so people. Can All right. Yeah, those. and do listen to my podcast, Sales Enablement, with Andy Paul. I mean, episodes. Yeah, episodes up to a thousand and ten. Wow! <laughs> wow! 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 Very cool, Andy. Thank you so much for your time. Really Thanks, Fred. It.